This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Ari Hart Radio Network, the Mutual Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and, of course, Exxon Broadcast Network. And speaking of which, if you'd like to find out all about the great programming we have available for you, 724-365, visit www.xzbn.net. When you're at the website, you're going to see a show entitled... Uh, a different perspective. The host is Kevin Randall. He's a retired U.S. Army lieutenant colonel who served combat tours as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam and an intelligence officer in Iraq. He has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. He has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases, including the Leveland sightings and a series of sightings over Washington, D.C. in 1952. He has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs and has made dozens of uh, presentations to colleges and other organizations. He is considered, without a doubt, one of the leading experts in the Roswell UFO crash of 1947. He had written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century, and hosts a blog, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Joining me this hour is the host of The Mostess, from a different perspective, and my good friend, Kevin Randall. Kevin, welcome back to the Exxon. Great having you with us, my friend, and congratulations on a great show. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate all the kind words you said about me, and the check will be in the mail soon. I, this time, can you send somebody from Ukraine here that check was a lousy worker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, we've already descended into that sort of thing. Well, I was going to say Cal Korf was a check, and that's why I don't take checks anymore. And that would probably be true. <laughs> hey, listen. But we don't we don't know where he is. He could be in India. He could be in Washington. He could be in outer space. Well, uh, most probably he is doing a Secret Service mission with the Israeli Super Secret Service. I think so. Yeah, he's probably I think he's so. probably a a a, a, a twenty seven star general by now. <laughs> well, all I have to do is get promoted again, and he'll jump over my <laughs> rank. So. Listen, Kev, you and I were talking uh, yesterday uh, while uh, doing your show about the latest, uh, the latest episodes and the latest doings of one John Ventry. And can you tell our listeners a bit of the background uh, of this moron, I mean of this gentleman? Well, I don't know much about him other than he was a high mucky muck in the MUFON organization. He was a state section director of uh, – actually, two states. He was a state director of two states, I mm-hmm. should say, Pennsylvania and Delaware, put on programs for um, a MUFON in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and had some, um, I guess, input into the their big symposium in um, – Las Vegas coming up in July. So he was into UFOs. He was writing books. I think they're more or less self-published, but I'm not really sure about the publisher. And um, was kind of running roughshod over his uh, small empire in the greater MUFON empire. 
But he got himself into some very, very hot soup within the last couple of days. Well, in uh, the last 10 days or so, yeah. He, on his personal Facebook page, he was apparently offended by a Netflix program, which I've never heard of, and uh, put it, put a uh, comment on there about that and then just descended into a racist rant that was outrageous in its content. I mean, just condemning everybody who doesn't happen to be a white male, apparently. And uh, I guess it generated a bunch of comments to his Facebook page. And the executive director of MUFON put out a statement sometime after that saying, well, you know, uh, everybody's entitled to their opinions. And it seems, you know, who is worse, the the person making the post or the haters who respond to the post? And I'm thinking the haters that respond to the post, this guy makes these outrageous racist comments. Yeah. And we're not supposed to be offended by that nor respond to it. And if we do, then we're the haters. Uh, excuse me. I think we've got that backwards. You and I have to take a commercial break, Kevin. When we come back, uh, let's talk more about this. And I also have a press release that I issued going back to 2014 about some of the craziest comments I had ever seen in my life from the same person we're talking about, John Bentry. Exo Nation, Kevin Randall is our special guest, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And you can listen to Kevin Randall. His show is entitled A Different Perspective on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Just go to www.xzbn.net, find out when Kevin is on, and listen. It's free. It's great. Tell your friends. Once again, www.xzbn.net. I'm Rob McConnell. Kevin and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good to Be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? 
Wire crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere. Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. Kevin Randall is my special guest this hour. His blog spot is www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And Kevin has a new book out, Exxon Nation, entitled Roswell in the 21st Century. And uh, before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, the former Delaware and Pennsylvania director of MUFON, uh, John Ventry. And going back to, uh, let me see, uh, March the 11th, 2014, I issued this uh, release. Although the subtitle of this article is John Ventry, PA State Director of MUFON, claims Malaysian uh, Malaysia Air Flight 370 was abducted by extraterrestrials seems to be from the front page of those seedy tabloid newspapers that are found at every grocery store checkout stand. This is the email that I received this morning from John Ventry. Okay, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let me see. Let's get, to the, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this thing. Uh, this is, the, he wrote this on March the 11th and sent it out at in, Mar- in 2014, I might add. And he issued this at 10.01 a.m. Although authorities are baffled, the fact is that the largest aircraft cannot just disappear, or can they? Between black boxes, transponders, radar, debris fields, explosions, and missile strike signatures, evidence is always left behind. The one explanation that hasn't been mentioned by mainstream media is that the plane and its passengers were abducted by extraterrestrial. The truth has a long history. Number one, December of 1945, five bombers from Fort Lauderdale took off and disappeared in clear weather. A large Martin Mariner was set up to find Flight 19. They disappeared also. Six planes and 27 crew vanished. Number two, uh, in 1953, General Benjamin Chidlaw said, We have stacks of flying saucer reports. We take them very seriously when you consider how many men and planes have been lost trying to intercept them. Number three, on November 23, 1953, an F-89C Scorpion jet was scrambled from Kinross Air Force Base to intercept a UFO. On radar, the two merge, and the jet and its four-member crew vanish. The military monitors everything using sonar, radar, satellites. I'm certain our satellites observed what really happened. The truth, uh, but that's a tr- I'm sorry, but that's a truth that cannot be revealed. So there you have it, the same guy who was making racial slurs said that Flight 370 was abducted by UFOs. And then they wonder why people don't take them seriously, uh, Kevin. The other thing, there there were multiple mistakes in that statement. Uh, Flight 19 
was um, Avenger torpedo bombers yeah. with three man crew. There was only uh, 14 people assigned. One of the guys didn't do it, or, or didn't make the flight. The um, Martin Mariner was seen to explode in midair. So it didn't disappear without a trace. It exploded. The um, Navy was in communication with the flight leader, Flight 19, for a great period of time. And it's quite clear that they were not flying in clear weather. Yeah. They were flying in very marginal weather. And the uh, flight commander said when the first guy's down to 10 gallons of gas, we'll all ditch together. The thought being they'd be in a much larger group and have a better chance for being uh, saved and surviving this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, we can just we can go on. The, uh, the Ken Ross case, it was not a four-member crew. It was a two-member crew. It didn't carry four people. And yes, the, the blips were seen to merge and, and uh, never separated. By the way, the Canadians were blamed for that. It said that they, they were launched to intercept a um, Canadian, Canadian Air Force uh, C-47. And the Canadians, of course, denied it. And I tend to mm -hmm. believe the Canadians on that one. So, oh, right. I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that he said in that that was just wasn't quite accurate. But the the thing is that when you have somebody who is supposed to be your representing uh, and and at the helm of the investigative branch of MUFON for the state of Pennsylvania and Delaware, when they make such a ludicrous, I mean, this is sheer stupidity, uh, and issues a press release like that. I know that I my rebuttal was uh, was carried on CNN and CBC, and you know, not one person said Rob. You know, this guy this guy is right on. Everybody said he was a nut. Yes, yeah. There's really no way to defend defend it, and it makes mm -hmm. us all look bad by saying that thing. Although I will say, I think a CNN analyst said that uh, it was it was hit by a black hole and was sucked into a black hole in some fashion, which was even more ludicrous than being abducted. But airplanes fall into the ocean and disappear all sure. the time. Uh, it's not that strange. Uh, I just saw something last night by the but. Uh, by the way, that uh, talked about Flight 19 not ditching in the ocean. We got lost in the big Okefenokee Swamp in uh, what uh, 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 middle of Florida, up into uh, Georgia. Yeah, and that it would never they would never be found because if they sunk into the swamp, I find that a little hard to believe because I think they would have noticed they were over land at that point. But um, you know, it, it's a viable viable explanation. I'm absolutely convinced they. They disappeared into the ocean, and at some point, some of the wreckage is going to be found, and then we're going to have an answer. We've got an, any number of these incidents where planes have supposedly vanished, and we found them. The, the last one was a star dust that disappeared supposedly on a, within 50 miles or in, in sight of the uh, airport at, in Santiago, Chile, and we find out later – a, a, a mountain expedition, I think uh, Argentina Army or somebody was in the mountains that separate Argentina from Chile and found the wreckage of the plane. They've even been able to identify some of the bodies uh, by DNA, but the, the plane crashed into the mountains. It wasn't within this sighting distance of the airport. The navigator thought they were that close, but they were actually way off course, and they flew into a mountain in the uh, – Glacier kind of sucked them up and, and spit them out 50, 60 years later, and then the wreckage had been found. They found serial numbers on the engines that corresponded, and they were able to identify some of the bodies that they were recovered in this thing. So, you know, planes disappear all the time. But it seems that the UFO community is, is, is amassing a number of black eyes. First of all, you had that alien, the exposing of the alien body going into Mexico, and you carry that, cover that on your show. Uh, now we've got uh, John Ventry again making a total fool of himself. You still have people who are lying through their teeth about their knowledge and what they claim to have seen at Roswell, New Mexico. And, and apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, Members of an inner circle at MUFON who pay $5,000 U.S. a year get special treatments. I, I had never heard of this. I have spoken or communicated with members of the board of directors. Mm -hmm. I have been in contact with state directors who have never heard of this. Um, I blundered into it as I was doing research into what Ventry had said and what he was doing and all of that thing. Actually looking for MUFON's response to him, and we had a very lame 
response, as, as I mentioned, about uh, uh, the haters responding to this. And they finally came out and said, well, you know, this guy is no longer the state director, which they should have done immediately, if not sooner. But you've got all of that going on, and I cannot find out a lot about this inner circle. All I can tell you is that it's 13 members. Ventry is one of them. Um, so he's got money to burn, apparently. I do not know if some of the members actually pay that fee. There's a number of, of – and I'll say men because uh, I – well, there's men and women, but the state direct, the directors have been men. Uh, international directors for MUFON are in that inner circle, and I don't know if they are uh, paying the five grand. And there's some real wackadoodles in that inner circle that have five grand apparently a year to burn. And I don't know how much influence that inner circle has on MUFON. I know based on what I've heard from a couple of the um, uh, board members, directors and board members of, of MUFON, that the input isn't all that great. But I suspect the input may be much more substantial than the, some of these people think. Uh, especially when it when it comes through um, Jan Harzan, who is the executive director of MUFON at the moment, who is a member of this inner circle. There are 13 people in the inner circle, by the way. I think that's just a coincidence that uh, they can't find a whole lot of people who are mm. willing to kick in five grand a year, supposedly to be on the inside of, uh, of MUFON. Isn't that funny? Because there are 13 members of a coven. I was actually thinking of <laughs> Jesus and his thirteen disciples or twelve disciples, but, <laughs> but but you're absolutely right as well. But I think it's a coincidence that that's all they can find that has five grand laying around uh, that they want to get rid of every year. Is Mufon succeeding as an organization, in your opinion, or do they need dire help? They originally were started, and I covered this. I've, I've been to post on my blog here. Uh, probably later tonight or tomorrow, uh, my take on MUFON and explains how it started mm -hmm. um, back then. But I think the idea originally was to look at the UFOs with a scientific eye, try to gather evidence properly and that sort of thing. And it's morphed into what looks to be a money-making operation. And that is its mission now, to make money. The um, symposium that's coming up in Las Vegas uh, in July, uh, I think it costs you like $359 to attend. But then if you want to go to some of the uh, presentations, it costs you additional money. If you want to take the trip to Area 51, it costs you additional money. And that one I'm not – you know, they're going to have to rent buses and that sort of thing. So that that may be okay. But yeah, there's costs in like, the world, yeah. But but it seems like every time you turn around, it's additional money. Uh, you can join for five dollars a month, apparently, collected all at one time. So you pay it pay at one time. But then there's other levels you can get in, and as you go up the levels, you get more and more goodies. None of which seem very impressive to me. So you're spending you end up spending four or five hundred dollars a year belonging to MUFON. Um, they used to publish their uh, UFO journal, the mm -hmm. MUFON UFO journal. And, and send it to all the membership. And now it's an e-journal, and I'm not sure. It seems by looking at the website that if you want a hard copy, it costs you extra. And I'm thinking if, you, if you're sending me an e-journal, I'll just print it out if I need a hard copy that badly. But it just seems like every time you turn around, there's something else that they're asking for in the way of a donation to keep their organization going. I have heard um, membership figures as high as 5000 and as low as about uh, 2500 and it's figures that uh, you know I've been able to find mm -hmm. on the internet in the last 10 12 days so they're allegedly current figures so I don't know what the membership is now it also seems to me that one of the problems we're running into with the UFO organizations and that sort of thing is simply that there's so much available on the internet that you really don't need to join an organization to gather that information i mean i publish it on my blog there's no button to click for donations. There's no ads on the blog. I make no money on it. I'm just providing information, the best information I can find at the time. You and I have to take uh, another break here, Kevin. We'll be back shortly. When we come back, what has MUFON ever accomplished when it comes to UFOs? That's my question. 
Kevin Randall is our guest, ExoNation, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And Kevin and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And if you'd like to listen to Kevin's show, it's entitled A Different Perspective. Just go to xzbn.net, take a look at the schedule, the daytime schedule or the evening schedule, find out when Kevin is on, and all you have to do is go back to xzbn.net and listen. We'll be back. Don't go away. are our personal gateways into infinite wisdom. Don't miss Shamanic Counselor and Indigenously Trained Dream Decoder Sandra Corcoran's inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles Sandra's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers and her initiations throughout the Americas and across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. Sandy's knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth influenced her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private tarot readings, international journeys, a meditative CD, as well as her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate this earthwalk, creating a deeper connection to yourself and all that is. Find this and more at Sandy's website, starwalkervisions.com. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen.
Exxon Nation, Kevin Randall is our guest this hour. And if you'd like to uh, visit Kevin's blog, it's www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. So, Kevin, over the years, what contribution has MUFON and their membership and their investigators, their their hoopla-wearing people who go to all these different uh, symposiums, exhibitions, and go out and do UFO investigations, what have they accomplished? They've been able to share information about UFO sightings. That's it? Um, I I don't really know of them accomplishing anything, but you can say the same thing of APRO. You can say the same thing of NICAP, two two organizations that have ceased to exist, the Center for UFO Studies, gathering information and disseminating disseminating it is about all that they've really accomplished. There were opportunities not just by MUFON, but opportunities by other UFO organizations to gather some scientific data, to to gather multiple chains of data Mm -hmm. so that you can lead to a conclusion. It's not just witness testimony, but there's landing traces, there's radar, there's photographs, and all of that sort of thing that you could sort of meld into a a sighting or have a sighting that you have those multiple chains of evidence, which would be much more impressive. But but that isn't done. It's – I think the problem is – um, well, there's many problems, but but one of the problems is you've had an awful lot of people who join MUFON to reinforce their belief structures. They want to believe in alien visitation, and here's an opportunity to do that because the um, the publications and all the other things that they engage in are slanted toward a belief in the extraterrestrial, in the alien visitation. And if you dare to suggest that there might be a rational explanation, by rational, uh, natural explanation for Mm -hmm. some of the UFO sightings, they become very, very angry with you. When Gerald Anderson appeared on the Roswell stage, uh, telling this wonderful story of how he saw the crashed craft and the alien bodies back in 1947 when he was a five-year-old child, um, there was an awful lot of support for that story. And as I looked into it and talked to Anderson and did my investigation, I found out that he was less than candid in what he was saying. Um, He accused, he mentioned the archaeologist that was supposedly on the Barney Barnett site over on the plains of St. Augustine as part of the Roswell case, gave us the name uh, Buskirk. We found Buskirk. Guy was still alive, Hmm. had uh, had had a PhD in anthropology. And we were trying to figure out how did Anderson know this guy, and we discovered that Buzz Kirk, who lived in Albuquerque, had taught at the Albuquerque High School, and we learned that Anderson had attended the Albuquerque High School and attended the class that Buzz Kirk taught in anthropology. So Anderson named the guy, he said, well, this was the leader of the archaeologists, thinking Buzz Kirk was long dead, and he wasn't. I had some very nice conversations with Buzz Kirk and got some nice letters from him. And uh, But but I, because I was exposing Anderson as being less than candid, I was the bad guy. They didn't want to hear about it. And Walt Anders, who at the time was the international director of MUFON, came up to me and says, I'm absolutely wrong about Anderson and the truth will out. Well, we finally got the evidence and proved that Anderson had been uh, forging documents to make his case. And the only person that had the grace to apologize to me or say he was sorry was Antonio Huneas. Everybody else who had been condemning me for uh, exposing Anderson just sort of uh, brushed it off and went on their own. But if you, in the UFO community, if you want to make a big uh, splash, if you want to get invited to all the conferences and all the symposiums and get people to buy your books and the magazines you write for, then you embrace Everything in the UFO field, no matter how stupid it is, like alien abductions, if you don't embrace that, then you're an outcast and you're a debunker. And uh, I think the funniest one was I was a uh, I had worked for Hector Quintanilla, who was the head of Project Blue Book in the late 1960s. Well, in the late 1960s, actually in 1967 is when I graduated from high school, and I hesitate to say that because that certainly <laughs> dates me, but. I graduated in 1967 and went immediately into the Army and was trained as a helicopter pilot, went to Vietnam, and by the, I got back in the um, fall of 1969, about the time the Air Force announced the end of Project Blue Book. There's absolutely no way I could have been a part of Project Blue Book uh, 
while I was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam and doing all these other things. And yet that allegation has been slung at me. It's The other one that just cracks me up is, uh, well, you know, Randall comes up with these very um, clever scenarios because he writes science fiction. I am the only person I know of whose day job disqualifies him from UFO research. Uh, and if you want to look at the people who write science fiction, well, uh, Bruce McAbee has written science fiction, but he's he's okay. Um, well, that's because uh, he's Street. a believer. You know, he'll he'll just he'll just accept anything that's told to him. Bruce is Bruce is a little bit more skeptical than some of them, but it, it, and that's the point. You know, he 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 buys into this, so it's okay. Uh, and if you take a look at the membership of the Science Fiction Writers of America, and it's about the only organization I belong to, you find out that about half of them are working scientists. Hmm. I mean, real, honest-to-God scientists, and they write science fiction as an advocation or because they they love to write science fiction, which is why I do it. I My mission in life was to become a science fiction writer, and I succeeded at that. I've managed to publish some books on science fiction, so I'm, I'm delighted about that. But these other things come in. Uh, to, to view as well, mm -hmm. and I think that you know we've got to take a look at all of that sort of thing. So why does why would anyone want to join MUFON just to carry a little card that says they're a member of MUFON, or that they can go to these different uh, symposiums, these different uh, events that are held? Depending on the level of membership, you might get a laminated card with a lanyard that you can wear around your neck. Like all the important people do in Washington D.C., you uh -oh. know. Um, I think a lot of it is you are looking to reinforce your belief structures, and this will do it for you. I believe that aliens are visiting Earth. I go to the co conference, and the information supports that belief structure. Um, they don't want to hear alternative explanations, even when the alternative explanation is completely and totally plausible and makes good sense and explains a case. They don't want to hear it. They want to embrace the idea that we're being visited by aliens. And not only that, they're crashing wholesale. Um, I found a list on online of 300 supposed UFO crashes. This is absolutely preposterous. If that many had crashed, we'd all know about it. Um, I've done a couple of books on UFO crashes, looking at all of this all of this data. At one time, a few years ago, I said there may be five that are looking solid. There's information for five. I would say now there's some interesting information about some of these events, and there's nothing that really proves a crash anywhere. When I was looking at writing Roswell in the 21st century, the one thing I wanted to do was look at it as a cold case. Look at all the evidence that had been gathered, look mm -hmm. at everything that had been written and talked about it in the last 25 years, 30 years, and see what holds up. And as you go through this stuff, you find the statements made by some of the prominent players uh, being altered significantly. You find out that some of the uh, prime players were just flat-ass lying about their involvement, Glenn Dennis being a prime example. He was the mortician that supposedly uh, was called about the coffin, the child-sized coffins, and then his nurse buddy, um, who participated in some kind of a preliminary autopsy, was transferred off the base and killed in a aircraft accident um, not long after that transfer. You know, you find out that that story is simply not true. Uh, and and you look at all of that, and we're left with testimony of some people that I think are credible. Edwin Easley, who was the provost marshal, kind of the chief of police at the Roswell base at the time, his testimony seems plausible. Uh, some of the other people who did not take a central role mm -hmm. testimony seems plausible. But it really doesn't get you to the extraterrestrial. It gets you to a strange event. That's right. But that that doesn't take you into space. What you need to take you into space is the the craft and the bodies and all that testimony of seeing the craft the uh, an intact type craft or the bodies of the alien creatures that's all seemed to have blown up yeah um, as i looked at all of that information so when you say what happened at roswell well you know five or six years ago i said it was an alien spacecraft we've got an awful lot of evidence and when i tried to trace down the evidence i found out we didn't have all that much we just had some testimony and most of it was fairly rocky so based on all the all the research you have done to date Kevin and and I know that that you've done a lot of research and my hat has always been off to you you know not only for the service you've given to your country but 
to the credibility that you that you instill in your research. What do you believe happened in Roswell, New Mexico, going back to 1947, some 70 years ago? I have no clue. I can tell you what it wasn't mm-hmm. because the records are there. You know, was it a missile that was launched from the at the time it was a White Sands missile, uh, White Sands Proving Ground? Now it's White Sands Missile Range. There's nothing in the records that show, show that that would have been the source of the debris. The Air Force checked out aircraft accidents, as did I, as did I think Don Berliner, uh, who was another researcher with the Fund for UFO Research. Nothing there. Uh, any kind of experimentation, um, really nothing there. I know Nick Redfern has come out with his his new book on the uh, the Roswell case, suggesting some kind of an experiment involving Japanese uh, captured Japanese soldiers yep. or something like that uh, from World War II. But it's like two years after the war, and frankly, if you look at it using Occam's razor you, to to make that explanation work, you don't have to invent interstellar travel with uh, alien visitation you have to do that but I, I think I think Nick is wrong on that and I found nothing that really leads to that that explanation and had that happened and we killed five Japanese soldiers back in 1947 or former soldiers or members of this uh, unit 731 I think it is which was a very disgusting unit in what they were doing um, I'm not sure that that information wouldn't have come out a long time ago and the government would have embraced it and said, yeah, we did this lousy thing. And Because they've already done that. I, there was an experiment in the 1930s, and I'm, I'm not sure whether they actually infected the black uh, men with the syphilis virus or the men had syphilis, had contracted syphilis through a uh, natural process, if you will. And uh, rather than treating it, they pretended to treat it so they could watch the disease as it progressed and see what happened. Uh, very, very disgusting thing to have done. But um, that's all come out. So I cannot see them hiding this thing of using captured Japanese soldiers in this experimentation. All right, so let, have... let me ask you this question. Based on what you just said, Kevin, and as you know, we've got to go to a break soon. Yes. If this information would have come out about the Japanese hypothesis as Nick presents it. How come there hasn't been a craft? How come there hasn't been more explicit details and more more smoking gun information when it comes to the Roswell event? I would think that if it was as Nick postulates, that we would have that documentation. We would see that in the Air Force when they did their investigation in 1995 mm-hmm. would have come out and said, Here's, here it is. Here's what we've discovered. Here it is. Uh, Disgusting thing we did, but it's 50 years in the past. Everybody involved is dead, so who cares? Yeah. And, but we've explained it. And the problem is we don't have that information. If it was extraterrestrial, then that might be a secret they want to keep even today. You and I will be back on the other side of this break. Exxon Nation, Kevin Randall's our very special guest, a good friend to the Exxon, and the host of A Different Perspective on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information on Kevin, you can check out his great blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And you can also get a copy of Kevin's latest book. I think it's number, what, 40 or 41 on his growing list? Roswell in the 21st Century. What's that? A book you've, I published like 130 books. All right, there you go. You beat Brad Steiger. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Are you curious? Do you want to learn more about how the world works and have fun at the same time? Study coincidences with me, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, on my Connecting with Coincidence radio show here on the XZBN network. Listen to Jungians theorize, statisticians randomize, true believers evangelize, while I categorize. I dance to the rhythm of coincidences. People who experience me see more of them. Maybe something on the show matches a thought in your mind. Let us know. Expand your mind to the weirdness happening around you. Synchronicity spoken here, there, and everywhere. For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence in your search engine and find my website, my social media sites, and my blog. This 
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Kevin Randall is our guest for this hour, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Kevin, uh, first of all, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Always a great pleasure talking to you. I, I, uh, you know, Roswell, you know, with all the computer hackers that are out there, with all the whistleblowers that are out there, how come nobody really just hasn't come out with any of of the material or anything that can be used as concrete evidence that there was at least one UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico on that fateful day in 1947. I would guess, if that's true, I mean, it was a UFO crash. Mm -hmm. I would guess that the information hasn't been digitized, that they're keeping it separated from the net for the very reason you express is that it would be hacked at some point and we would get more information about it. Mm. That would be my guess. I don't know. I, as I said, I'm not sure it was alien at this point. I looked at the, um, all, as I said, all the explanations. I tried to examine the evidence at great length in Roswell in the 21st century. I know that the skeptical world thinks it was a Project Mogul balloon, but that doesn't make any sense either because A, 
Mogul wasn't as secret as they claimed it was. Only the purpose was what they were doing in New Mexico was not secret. The name Mogul was not classified because Albert Crary mentioned it in his diary, his, his notes in, from 1947 a number of times. Mm -hmm. the, it was just um, trying to create a constant level balloon, the New York University project. And it, they published information about it in the newspaper on July 10th as kind of a way to explain, well, here's what the flying saucers are. There are these Mogul balloons. But um, the Mogul – again, the Mogul uh, – Balloon launches are all all uh, all listed, and we know what happened to them. Flight number four, the culprit they they name, uh, it says in Crary's field notes and in his diary that the uh, flight was canceled, didn't fly. What they did do was launch a cluster of balloons. Well, what's a cluster of balloons? Well, we know what it was based on the um, information published by the New York University in a ver in a number of various. Uh, reports cluster balloons mean they would they would send a microphone up with five or six balloons attached to it to see if they could pick up the sounds of detonations on the ground and that sort of thing as a way of at least doing something because we can't launch the whole array type thing so uh, you know that explanation fails so we have no explanation for this story we have uh, Jesse Marcel's comments about what he had seen we have Sheridan Cabot's uh, ex, uh, descriptions of what he had seen. Cavett saying, well, it was a balloon, but Cavett also told me in conversations that it, he was too busy to go out to pick up any balloons, but that became the Air Force explanation, and so we'll run with that. Uh, Cavett being a good Air Force officer in that respect. But um, we, so we have descriptions of this material. We have descriptions of what the field looked like. We have this thing from reliable people. Bill Brazel had no reason to, to uh, talk to us about this if, if he hadn't held the debris in his hand and that sort of thing. So there's that kind of confusion you run into that it se this seems plausible mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem that this, this stuff that he was describing was available in the uh, technology of the day and that sort of thing. So there's those sorts of conundrums that are inexplicable at the moment. But it, again, that doesn't lead us to the extraterrestrial. To get to the extraterrestrial, we actually need to see the craft of the bodies or right. photographs and government reports about it. We don't have any of that. All we have is the testimony. We don't have any bits of the debris. Although almost from the beginning, we began the investigation. And I say we, Don Schmidt and I, began our investigation in 1989. We were teased with the idea that there are photographs, there are pieces of debris. And one of the guys who supposedly had taken photographs you know, in a, uh, had a bizarre first name, but they wouldn't tell me the last name. And so Don and I went to the, the tax assessor's office in Chavez County and says, can you sort by first names? And they said yes. And we said gave them the name and we came up with three matches. Two of them were businesses and one was a private residence. We went and talked to the guy and he wasn't the right guy. Photographs have never surfaced. We promised them they've never surfaced. Debris promised it's never surfaced or if it has surfaced, it turns out to be something mundane. And, and this is the thing that's always scared me. Let us say I have a real piece of debris from an alien spacecraft and I take it to be analyzed and they say, hey, it's aluminum. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you can't go anywhere with it. It's aluminum, big, big whoop. You know, it doesn't prove anything. But that's where we are. All we have is some testimony, some testimony that I find credible, like from Edwin Easley and Bill Brazel, to just to name two of the people. But other testimony from uh, any number of people you care to name is blown up. But, but uh, wouldn't it be fair to say that none of the people who give the testimony would have the expertise to actually say that this was an extraterrestrial craft? I think when you're involved at the highest levels of this and you're in, and you you know about the analysis you can say this is something that is not available on earth mm -hmm. and that takes you to the extraterrestrial we don't really have that um i asked edwin easley who was the provost marshal i said to him are we following the right path and he said what do you mean i said well we think it was extraterrestrial and he said well let me put it this way it's not the wrong path well okay um uh, not really a a, a Great statement leading us to the extraterrestrial, but it, it's suggestive of that. By the same token... Um, Sounds like something right? Trump would say. Or Trudeau. Trudeau. Or Cal Korf. No, no, no. I, no. I, well, we, no, let's not drag Cal into this because then it <laughs> just becomes ugly. <laughs> Any, anyway, but I mean, the point is, we look at Payne Jennings, who was the... I forget whether he was the executive officer or the deputy base commander, one of the two. He was, he was like the second-ranking guy on the, on the base. 
Um, and he said, oh, this never happened. And I wish I, it was an alien. I wish these people would stop bothering me. So we can look at it and say, well, one member of, Ray, Ray, I'm sorry, uh, Blanchard's staff, Blanchard staff, Blanchard being the base commander, said it wasn't anything important. And a couple of other members of the staff said, well, yeah, it was really, really strange. So, I mean, you take the side of the fence you want to come down on and you can find evidence and to, to support that point of view. And that's, and that's the problem I have with Roswell today. What about uh, the latest information that was uh, issued uh, that came out today that uh, in an article that Philip Mantle wrote about a, a, a sheriff or a deputy sheriff whose testimony, who had never been heard before, was actually a witness to Roswell? Actually, his testimony had been heard before, and it was rejected by almost everybody. But the problem is, um, when I read the the um, description he mm-hmm. gave, I recognized immediately what he was talking about, and it was uh, based on a picture I had taken. When uh, Frank Kaufman was what we thought was a legitimate source, and he had taken this where the thing was supposedly found, I took a picture from the lip of the canyon looking down into the into the, the valley there and this guy's description fits that picture to a T. He saw the picture in one of the books and he ran with it and he talked about the information as it was related by Frank Kaufman. Well, we now know Frank Kaufman was lying to us. Mm-hmm. He hadn't been there. He wasn't involved. So this sheriff's deputy stuff was bogus as well. But he's a Texas deputy sheriff and he says, well, we were driving into Roswell to pick up a prisoner and we heard about this on the radio. The police radio or the radio radio? And what, what was it? And they drove out to the site and I'm thinking there's no way you can find the site without specific instructions on how to get there. And by the time he arrived in New Mexico and in the Roswell area, the military cordon was allegedly already up. So he couldn't have gotten there even if they'd found the right road to drive down uh, he would have run into the military court, and they wouldn't have let him in. First of all, he's a uh, deputy sheriff from Texas. And second of all, the MPs had him outgunned, so there was nothing he could do about it. But they would have said, no, you can't get through here. You have no authority. This is a closed area. Go away. So he had never gotten close to see anything. Right. And I, I did a thing on my blog about this when it, when it first broke from Phyllis Mandel and put the picture in color <laughs> on my blog so people could look at it. And see, this is the description. Now, this this story is uh, bogus, completely and totally bogus. It's just some guy trying to get his fifteen minutes in fame, his fifteen minutes of fame, by plugging himself into the Roswell story. And, um, and if you want to visit the blog that Kevin is talking about, it's www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. One quick uh, question, Kevin. As you can see by your clock, we're coming down to the final minutes here in the X Zone with Kevin Randall. Um, why is Stanton Friedman credited with being the person who who catapulted Roswell, the event in Roswell, into the hoopla it is today? Well, the, Stan Friedman's crediting himself, of course. Yeah. But to be fair, in 1978, while he was in New Orleans, you know, one of the producers at a TV station said, the, the guy you need to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Because Marcel was a ham radio operator, and he'd be talking to his um, ham radio buddies that he'd picked up a piece of a flying saucer. So Friedman, Friedman in the airport while he was waiting for the plane called him and talked to him and did nothing with the story for like a year. Because Jesse couldn't remember. that He said, well, it was 1940s sometime, and I was at Roswell, and I don't know this. Uh, Bill Moore found a picture of Marcel in the newspapers, um, I think July 8th, July 9th, July 9th, July 10th, 1947, and kind of – focused it on that and so more did the book the roswell incident with um berlin not berliner uh charles berlitz right and that didn't go anywhere and then um stan got off on mj12 which was this bogus document that supposedly proves that there's alien visitation uh, don schmidt and i actually when we did our book on roswell kind of brought things back into focus but everybody had kind of moved on from that until we started our reinvestigation and exploded out of there so i think you know we all can kind of take credit for it you know stan for finding jesse marcel um len springfield for interviewing marcel and getting him to the uh, reporters more in berlitz for doing the book and talking to a number of the people there stan for being involved in that investigation um then don schmidt and me getting involved in an investigation and running with it from there so i think that's kind of the evolution of the Roswell case. And which brings us up to today. And Kevin, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us. Congratulations on your show. I have the pleasure of listening to it. It's a great show. 
I love the guests you bring on. And Exo Nation, if you're into UFOs and if you want to get the real story, not the fake news story, listen to Kevin's show, A Different Perspective. And you can find out all about Kevin on his blog spot at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And Kevin, take care of yourself, my friend. Speak to you next week. Thank you, and looking forward to talking to you. Exo Nation, I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. <laughs> 